Hey guys, uh, normally I would do a tip video tonight and this is kind of going to be a tip but it's going to also be an episode because it's going to be a little bit longer. Uh, T-positive matrix uh, male blood python here. Believe it or not, even though he's small, this male's actually proven and has uh, sired clutches. The uh, T-positive ivories that I have are, are his, uh, his offspring. Uh, I did the video the other day on feeding videos and feeder treatment and I see so often people asking, how often should I feed my snake? What size meals should I be feeding? And all that kind of stuff. So what this video is gonna be, it's gonna be a little bit of that. I'm not really gonna get into the specifics of this is what you should feed that snake and this and that, but I'm gonna talk a little bit about how you should figure out what you're feeding and why you shouldn't be feeding as often as a lot of you are. Um, there's a lot that we don't know about these snakes yet, but the more and more that we research them and the things that they do when they eat, uh, really tells us that they shouldn't be eating as often as we feed them. Uh, naturally in the wild, of course, they're opportunistic, so they may eat twice in a week, they might not eat for eight months. Uh, but ideally the way these guys are designed is for time to go by between meals. Uh, and so when I get into it later, I'll, you'll see why. Um, so now when you first start, when you're trying to figure out what you should be feeding your snake, uh, there's a list of factors you really want to look into. Uh, so you want to look at the species of the snake. For instance, this guy's a blood python. He has a very slow metabolism naturally. Uh, so he doesn't need a lot of food. He's the epitome of an ambush predator, meaning he's going to stay in one place as long as he possibly can. If he finds a spot where he feels he can see around him, but predators won't see him, he's going to sit there and he's going to wait for food to come to him. If it takes a week, a month, he's going to sit there. Uh, unless he's got to go and find other resources or something happens, these guys like to sit and wait. Uh, so their metabolism is designed to, to operate that way, to eat sparingly, to move sparingly, and that's what they are. Now, uh, age is definitely going to factor in as well. Uh, younger snakes tend to have a little bit higher metabolism because their body's growing and changing, and so that requires you know a higher metabolic rate to accommodate all of that. Uh, condition is going to matter uh, and not so much you know people will rescue snakes from time to time or feel that their snake is underweight and they want to rush it up to weight and that's not good for anything uh, these guys do a lot with a little so even if you have an extremely emaciated snake regular normal feeding uh, is going to get that snake up to weight faster than you would believe uh, you know these guys don't need a lot each meal they're gonna do a bunch with, especially if you do get a, a true, like underweight emaciated animal, they sometimes they won't poop for a little bit because they're using pretty much everything that you give them. Um, but uh, other than that, they don't need, you know, these, these higher amounts of meals, just a regular feeding schedule will do them just fine. Not to mention if a snake is emaciated and has gone that long without food and their body hasn't kicked up to that level of digesting food, throwing that at them a lot constantly in big meals really isn't a good idea. When I do rescue work and I do get an emaciated animal, I actually start them off with a pretty small meal just to get their system running, you know, let it do its thing, let that digest, and then I'll start with, you know, a normal size meal for where the snake is at. Uh, activity level is important too. So even though I said this species is pretty sedentary, I do have individuals that are more active than others. Just their personality, whatever it is, they tend to move more. So those snakes are gonna have a higher metabolism typically just from that activity, keeping that function up. So the, the same two snakes, the same species, same size, could even be clutch mates, could need a different feeding schedule because the activity level or individual metabolism is different. Uh, and so that's where we need to learn our animals and learn their body condition and what their body condition should look like and, and feed off of that. Everybody wants to feed off of the calendar because it's Tuesday or Thursday or it's been a week or 10 days or 12 days or whatever it is. Uh, and that's really not the way these animals are designed to eat. So I understand people want that structure, especially as a new keeper, to have a basis of where you're going to, you know, feed around. Oh, I'm sorry, buddy, Just slapped him right in the head. Um, so I, I understand that, but really throw the calendar out when it comes to feeding, you really should. Uh, you wanna learn to monitor your animal's condition and feed based on that. Also, breeder versus pet does make a little bit of a difference. 
a male breeder, you really kind of want on the lighter side. Uh, it keeps them more, more interested in breeding, a little more active when that time comes uh, than a fat, lazy male. I'm fat and lazy. I'm not trying to breed, see? I beat you to it. Anyhow, uh, breeder females as well. I still keep my breeder females trim, but I keep them with a little bit more weight than I would if they were having the year off. When they have the year off, I keep them a little thinner. Uh, when they're going to breed, I just give them a little bit extra. Not much. I mean, just a, a tiny bit. Uh, and it's just enough so that when they go through the process of egg production and they do take usually about two months off of food, uh, it's just to make sure everything goes smooth. Uh, you don't want them to be overweight when they're producing eggs and you don't want them to be underweight. Yeah, there's an ideal range where you want them and that's, that's where you want it. That's going to give you the least amount of slugs, least amount of problems. You know, way too little weight can be dangerous to them. Way too much weight can also be dangerous uh, and, and just give you a ton of fertility issues and other things. So keeping that balance is important if you're breeding. And hopefully if you're breeding, you've already figured out how, you know, over the years you've been keeping before you jump into that, of how to maintain and how to up their weight and drop their weight when you need to. One of the biggest mistakes people make when they get an overweight snake is not feeding it. Now that you're not feeding it, that metabolism is going to drop way down. Uh, and so now that that metabolism is at its base level, they're not going to work off any weight that way. You need to get that metabolism up but you also can't be throwing a, a ton of food at them because they're overweight. So you're gonna to wanna to feed them a, a smaller meal, uh, you know, maybe once every three to four weeks, you know, at least with blood pythons, just to keep that metabolism working and keep that system going. That'll actually help them drop weight, whereas just not feeding them at all can be pretty hard to take weight off of them. Uh, Cause like I said, that metabolism will slow down to nothing. Uh, and then you have that going on. So also, People have to consider what these animals naturally eat. Most of us are feeding rats from Norway. This snake has never been to Norway. Its ancestors, as far as we know, have never been to Norway. Maybe once upon a time in the Pangea days, you know, there was something like blood pythons in Norway, but not, not recently. So we're feeding a prey item that's not necessarily their natural food source. Uh, so it's important to remember that if you can vary their diet, it's good, whether it be with birds, other rodent species, you know, things like that. If you have a species that eats lizards and things like that and you have access to that, that's good too. Uh, different prey items have different fat levels. And one of the biggest things that people fail to realize, excuse me, that's really important is that even the same prey item at a different age has different levels of fat in its body. So if you're feeding a medium rat to this guy versus a retired breeder, a retired breeder is actually higher in fat content. So even though you feed him, say, you know, he really wouldn't ever eat a, a retired breeder, but let's imagine he's twice his size and he does, and that's his appropriate meal size. If all I fed him was retired breeders and I fed him on a perfect schedule, this snake could still die of fatty liver disease. Now snakes carry their weight differently than we do. So when we get fat, our fat goes over, over our ribs. These guys carry it underneath, and so it gets in there and clogs the passageways for their organs and everything else. It makes breathing more difficult for them. Uh, it makes everything more difficult. Uh, so it really taxes their system. Over, overweight and being obese in snakes is about the worst thing you can do to them. It's the worst kind of abuse and neglect. Um, on the thinner side is actually healthier than on the thicker side uh, in most cases. So... People really need to get that in their head. And like I said, the older prey items are higher in fat content. Fat all the time is gonna kill these guys. They're not built for it. They're lean machines. Even though blood pythons are heavy body, heavy body doesn't mean fat. It just means their rib cage is a little bit broader because they're not an arboreal snake. They're strictly terrestrial. They're designed for life on the ground and sometimes a little bit below, Even, but that's not, uh, they don't burrow as often as some other species. They like to be in the, the thicker grass or marshy areas, things, things like that. And that's their niche. And so, you know, being flat like that, they open up a little bit more. It'll help them absorb any heat, you know, from below or above, depending on what's going on so that they can maintain their, their lifestyle. Uh, so this snake climbing, not a good idea. Uh, it's very easy for them to hurt themselves. Whereas like a carpet python can climb very well. I'm sorry, buddy. Uh, so they, uh, they're structured a lot different. If I had a carpet next to me, you know, the same size carpet would be like this big as opposed to this guy because it's designed to be arboreal. Same with reticulated pythons and even Burmese pythons. 
Those snakes should be semi-arboreal even as adults. So when you see these people with these fat, disgusting retics and berms, it's really, really bad for their health. And that's why a lot of people have those animals drop dead at 10 years old, eight years old, 15 years old. Those animals should be living 20, 30 years easily with good care. Uh, and, and more, to be honest, we don't even really know the top end. I know there's a lot of ball pythons out there that are over 50 years old. Um, and a lot of people will tell you their lifespan's 30 years, but it seems like it's a lot more than that. Uh, and they're a really hardy species, which helps as well. So um, also, uh, I, I said to rotate prey frequency. I also like to rotate prey size. So I might feed this guy a small rat every now and again, which seems like a waste of a meal, but it still kicks up that metabolism. It still does what it does. It still gives him some, some food. And plus in his head, he's eaten, so he's relaxed. Uh, and then the next time I feed him, I might throw him, you know, a medium rat or almost to a large rat and give him a bigger meal. And now what I do is if I fed a smaller meal previously, I might feed a little bit closer together than had I done a bigger meal. Uh, so you always want to kind of keep those two factors working together. Uh, also, another thing that I like to do is actually give my snakes a fasting period. Um, if they're breeding, obviously that's going to happen naturally for the females. Um, but it's good every once in a while, and this most of the information I'm giving you is going to be for, you know, boas, pythons, things of that nature. Uh, I don't keep a lot of colubrid species. There are some colubrid species with extremely high metabolisms and activity levels. So that I'm not going to recommend you do with unless you know what you're doing and, and that I don't know enough to tell you. Uh, but with, with a lot of the python species, giving them three or four weeks without food once a year isn't going to hurt them. Uh, and it's, it's good to let their system just completely you know, kick all that stuff out. Like I said, naturally in the wild, they're gonna go sometimes one month, two month, three months, six months, they're built for that. Uh, and I'm not saying you should feed your snake every six months or seven months or anything like that. I'm just saying that, you know, a little bit of a fasting period is beneficial to them from time to time. And obviously if your snake is in a body condition or a health issue, then you don't do things like that. This is a healthy snake at ideal weight and, and all that kind of stuff. So. Uh, Hopefully that's common sense, but I figure I should say it anyway. So remember, infrequent is how they usually eat, so that's how their body's designed. So I said I was gonna let you know a little information. I did write some stuff down here. A lot of this I know off the top of my head, but some of it I don't, um, or I'll forget, so I have it written down. I'm getting touched in the face. Uh, so anyhow, uh, a lot of the studies that we have on metabolism in, in pythons, specifically are on Burmese pythons. They've just been the most studied. A lot of that is because grant money and things with what's going on in the Everglades, there's just a lot of research done into those snakes as they're trying to figure out how to get them out of there and things. And so one of the things to keep in mind, when you feed, you know, pretend this is a Burmese python, when you feed a Burmese python, and other pythons I'm sure are similar, and it's gonna vary a little bit from species to species, a lot of things change in their body and things that don't really change in other vertebrates. It's pretty crazy what happens. So uh, one thing that happens is their oxygen consumption increases. Uh, so that means they need better lung function at that point. Now, when they eat a meal, uh, almost immediately, usually within the first six hours, their body goes into overdrive. All their organs actually change genetically. Uh, over over 2,000 genes change their expression uh, in, in the snake's body. That's, that's wild. So gene expression is kind of what tells your, you know, your heart, your lungs, whatever it is, this is what size you grow to, this is how you function, whatever. Now all of a sudden that changes just while they eat. So their uh, organs actually double in size. Uh, and that takes about three days for them to hit their, their peak where they're doubled in size. Sometimes some of the organs will only go up about 40%, and this depends on meal size, but they do go up 100%. So, you know, if their, their heart was this big, all of a sudden it's that big. Uh, and so that's uh, very taxing on their body, which is also why, you know, you always tell people, leave them alone. And I don't think we leave them alone long enough. Uh, everybody says, oh, 48 hours, but 48 hours, they're still going up to that peak level in their body, and their body's still undergoing all those changes. Uh, and it actually takes 10 to 14 days for those genes to revert back to their normal state. So if you're feeding a Burmese python weekly, it is in a constant state of stress in that animal system. That animal system is never going back to zero. It's never basing out where it needs to base out. Uh, and like anything else, if you put wear and tear on stuff, it's more likely to fail over time. 
you want to exercise stuff the right way. Uh, and so putting all that strain on them constantly over and over and over and over without it ever getting a recovery period is not smart. It would be like you go into the gym every single day and hammering on like it's leg day and going higher and higher and higher and never giving your body a day to recover. It's just not healthy for you. And I'm not trying to anthropomorphize and say, you know, it's the same thing, but just to give you something that you can relate to, uh, you know, their body needs recovery time. So really, if it's taking 10 to 14 days for their body to return to normal, even if we're feeding every 10 to 14 days, we're still never allowing that to completely settle out and have a period of doing that. And that's why I think, especially in adult animals, that we should be feeding, you know, a large Burmese python only needs to eat every probably three or four weeks, if that. Once they get truly large and older, their metabolism's so slow, they really don't need a whole lot. And uh, so their metabolism, I said, it, it kicks up. So, you know, imagine their base metabolism is one. When they're digesting food, it can go up 10 to 44 times that resting metabolism. Uh, so that's huge, that's a huge increase. And so um, I really think that we should think twice about how much we handle after eating and how long we should go between feeding them based on this information that we have, which really has just come out in the last, uh, the last decade or so, a lot of this stuff. Some of it's come out about 20 years ago, there's been some preliminary studies, but the stuff where we learned about the gene expression and things like that and how the genes actually change and they only change while they're digesting and then they go back to normal. Uh, that's not something that we really see in other species. So it's pretty wild and it's pretty incredible that these animals do that. Uh, and so hopefully new, more and more research will be done into more and more species so we can get to a point where we better understand each species and we can tailor our keeping to them. Um, as I always preach, you know, captivity is not the wild and so we do do things a little bit differently. But we have to look at the functions of the animal and how this animal is built to survive. Uh, and we do have to use that information and we do have to regulate our keeping by that. Um, so it's another thing when people always talk about moving to feed and they'll tell you that it's dangerous because of regurgitation. Yes, you increase the risk of regurgitation by moving a snake immediately after it eats. Uh, and basically in that case, it would be because you're stressing the snake out and it's fight or flight is telling it, chuck up that meal so you can get away faster. Um, part of the reason that these guys can, can hide more and stuff after meals is because they're more vulnerable to predators. They can't move as quickly. Like I said, their whole body has changed. There's so much going on and all that stuff really wears on their system. So they want to rest and be comfortable. Um, but moving to feed really, uh, I don't think it's prudent when their body's going through all those changes to be handling them, manipulating them, moving them around. I think it's best for them to do what they know is best for them. Uh, not to mention the whole thing is a myth anyways, and we can get into that in another video, but moving to our feeding in the enclosure does not cause cage aggression. First of all, cage aggression is a stupid thing anyways. Snakes are defensive. So if a snake is offering a strike at you, it's either striking at you because it thinks you're food or because it feels like it needs to defend yourself. And most people that believe that myth can't distinguish the two anyway, so they really don't even know why their snake is striking. Uh, they just get it in their head that that's why, um, but that's not a true thing. I have kept a thousand snakes and every single one of them is eaten in a cage and none of them have cage aggression. Uh, overfeeding, you know, my female white lips a bitch, but she's a bitch always. Doesn't matter if she, where she's eating. Uh, and you can come over and take her out of her cage if you want to, to try to feed her out of her cage. I'm more than willing to let you have to sign a waiver. Uh, so we're gonna wrap this up, but basically uh, there are guidelines for, you know, if you're newer where you can kind of use the calendar to help you out, but you really wanna try to get to a more advanced level of keeping as quickly as you can and learn these animals and observe them, feed them, see how they act before and after a meal see how their body is growing, how their growth rate is. I don't weigh snakes, but if you need to, you can weigh them. Uh, just keep in mind with species like this, their weight's really gonna fluctuate because they're gonna hold on to their stool for a long time and then they're gonna drop it. And I've had snakes drop almost 25% of their body weight in one go. Um, you know, like an eight pound snake empty, drop two pounds of waste. That's a lot. I mean, just, just do the math in your head. Um, you know, 230 pounds, that's like 55 pounds of poop. It's not, not a pretty thought. Um, you know, and a snake like this, I've had, you know, drop more than a pound in a go. It's a lot. 
A pound is a lot. You don't really think it is until you see a pound of poop. It's a lot of poop. Uh, so if you are weighing them, it is best to weigh them when they're completely empty. Once they've gone to the bathroom, you know their system's empty. That's when you get your most accurate, true weight of the snake. Uh, any questions on this, feel free to let me know. Uh, if you jump on the Google machine there, there's lots of great articles on this stuff and there's a lot of research that's been done. Like I said, especially the last 10, you know, 20 years. Uh, if you just type in like, you know, snake, uh, uh, changes to a snake when feeding, a bunch of articles will come up for you and there's a lot of good reading there. Uh, so just try to keep that in mind when we're feeding our snakes that we're not going crazy, we're not stuffing them into obesity and early graves. I know I want to enjoy all of my snakes for 20, 30, 40 years if I can, longer if they'll, they'll have me. Uh, so I try to feed them in a way that I feel is, is conducive to that. All right. Thanks, guys. We'll see you.